guys, I want to welcome you to the weekly Wednesday for the Financial Freedom Newsletter, where every week, every Wednesday, we delve into something inspirational, motivational, something excerpt taken from the Financial Freedom Weekly Newsletter. Wherever you are, if you're listening on Spotify, on iTunes, Google, be sure to click the like, subscribe, share, comment. Without ado, let's get into the show. Hey guys, welcome to this week's podcast episode for the Financial Freedom for Physicians podcast. And today we're going to have a bread and butter episode on real estate. Real estate is how I got financially free, and I lo- I'm excited to welcome. Agostino, he's the founder and CEO of Bulletproof Cashflow. He's going to talk about cash flow, all the advantages, really standard for this audience. And I'm happy to welcome Agostino to the show. Welcome. Hey, thanks for inviting me, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, we had we got connected through Podmatch, and um, so you know, you know, everybody real estate is really a, a fundamental asset class. So tell people how you got started, and we'll dive into it. Absolutely. So, you know, it's funny. I got started in this 13, I'm sorry, 16, 17 years ago. And it was by mistake, right? I was actually, I moved to Virginia after owning a house and doing that whole thing in corporate, (laughs) moved to Virginia. And a friend of mine, when I was living there, he he recommends, he says, you should just go ahead and start buying houses, single family. So I started buying a bunch of single family homes. And uh, I had a mentor that showed me the ropes and how to do that kind of stuff. So I was buying up a bunch of single family homes, small multifamily, as many as I could, as fast as I could. This is in 2005, six and seven, before 2008, before the crash, right? So money was still fairly cheap. But then when I noticed that things were starting to climb, 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 I pulled back and I was right to pull back because my numbers stopped making sense. So it was always the same approach to be very careful about the deals you make. I learned back then which still applies even today. Fast forward about 16 years, I stepped away from doing the smaller deals and now do big monster deals. Now we do uh, stabilized multifamily assets. We have about 1600 units here in and around Cleveland. Uh, Although we've done a lot of that stuff and we continue to look for deals, today we've shifted our focus to development which is either urban infill or adaptive reuse, like say offices, that kind of thing, doing those types of conversions. We have two of those projects going on and three ground up deals taking place right now. We just finished the development as well. And we're also have a net lease fund. We have a fund, it's a blind pool fund that goes and acquires single tenant net lease. Dollar General, Dollar Tree, Walgreens, CVS. These are brands that you know, love, and trust, right? So it's those types of deals here that give you the steady monthly returns. The development gives you, you know, it takes a little bit longer to get those returns, but they're usually big, juicy squeezes, you know? (laughs) So not saying we're ignoring the first one, but we're finding that try to find those deals. It's, there's a few and far in between. And right now the deal flow is not really strong just because of where we are in the economic cycle. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. So it sounds like, you know, you've uh, progressed as a real estate investor, real estate entrepreneur. Um, you know, real quickly, I'm, uh, most doctors are uh, on the show. Most professionals, high, they understand the um, advantage of real estate, but just kind of briefly, and then we'll get into, you know, your progression from, you know, smaller to bigger deals. You know, it's funny. Um, <laughs> a lot of it had to do with just not having the knowledge, man. I mean, I remember sitting in Virginia, I'd done a bunch of single families and and small multifamily. And I was on the phone with a syndication attorney. And I just happened to look at this big multifamily. It's not big, big relative term, 30 units, not that big. And I said to the guy, I said, hey, who owns these buildings? He goes, what do you mean? Like, I go, who owns them? Like, does someone own them? Does a bank own them? Who owns them? He goes, what do you mean? People own them. I go, what people? Individuals. They, they syndicate. And he explains the whole syndication model to me. This is going back like six, seven years ago. And I'm like, he explains it. And I'm like, you know, I can do that. Now, I've, at, the, at that point, I mean, I worked in corporate. I used to run like large enterprise technology groups. I used to work at the C-level. So I understood the whole concept around raising money, 
around meeting with, with the board of directors and selling them on certain concepts that we're doing internal to the business. I mean, I, this stuff didn't really scare me. So I was, and the numbers didn't scare me either because I was somewhat familiar with it, right? Regardless, I mean, once I, once I understood that deals can be put together using the syndication model, it kind of opened up my eyes to, to the, the ability to take these deals down and put them together, at least as an option to do it. Of course, I had no idea how difficult it is to get your first deal. It's very, very tough to get your first deal done. I'm, I'm sure you know that. I'm sure you can tell plenty of stories, right? <laughs> the first deal is always the hardest, right? So in our in our coaching, in our mastermind coaching, I, I describe it like this. When you're trying to push a car, say a car breakdown and you try to push it on your own, the very first few, you know, maybe 10, 15 feet are always the toughest. But once the car starts moving, it becomes much easier to do. It gets even easier if you have other partners that are pushing along with you behind that car to get it moving forward, right? Doing a deal is kind of the same way. The first one's always the hardest, but once you get the second, the third, the fourth, it moves a whole lot faster, right? One of the reasons why we did it was for the cash flow. You know, certainly you have to pick the right market to do that kind of stuff. There's a cash flow market and an appreciation market. It's two very different types of markets. Okay. I wanted a cash flow. That was priority for me and my family at the time. It still is today. I mean, every deal that we do has to have cash flow, unless it's the development deal, obviously it's a little different. But we don't do like Miami. New York City, Los Angeles, those are very speculative and we don't do stuff like that. We just don't. That's not in our wheelhouse, right? We know what we're looking for. Um, anyway, so when I when I also under, began to understand some of the, the tax breaks you get, the depreciation, the accelerated depreciation, the, all those sorts of benefits that on the tax side, and you realize, folks, who is writing the tax laws? Congress. Congress puts the most amount of their money in real estate. Do you think they're going to write laws that goes against what they're doing? Of course not. Why? So you need to go buy more real estate. <laughs> That's why, <laughs> if you think about it, right? <laughs> yeah. Buy more real estate. It makes, it makes, I mean, I didn't know any of this stuff. I kind of like figured it out on my own, reading a lot of books, going through a lot of coursework. I, I figured this out. You know, it's, it's, and the best decision I ever made. I should have done it sooner. Should have yeah. done it sooner. Yeah. Follow the tax code. Um, that's where all the uh, and then uh, and you'll realize that W two earners get taxed the most, and that's why they always focus on jobs because they want to tax your income and and then you know the smart people realize you know business and real estate and investments. Um, so one thing we we're talking about what was interesting is this idea of um, capital gains and um, you know especially because you were talking about physician you know he was stock trading between patients and. You know, I'm sure he made more in that time than he did with his practice. But, um, you know, talk about kind of the, you know, it's not tax advantage for, um, you know, stock trading uh, flippers as well. Like if you're you're just flipping houses versus like if you're investing. Yeah. You know, I find that many people do certain things because they don't know how to do anything else. They're, they're do the whole stock flipping thing because they don't know that real estate is even an option, right? And, and you're 100% right. Active work, ten, like your, your W-2 job, active work, stock trading, active work, speculative trading of any kind, ETFs, all that sort of thing, is taxed at the highest rate, as opposed to taking money and investing and waiting, taxed at the lowest rate or among the lowest anyway, right? So what does it tell you? Obviously, investing is where you want to be as opposed to actively trading. Trading Either you're trading your, your money or you're trading your time in terms of a W-2. One of these two things. Very, very expensive to do both. And you're at a higher risk, if you ask me, right? You're risking your time in the hopes that, that whatever time you're spending actually gives you a good, healthy return. And there's only so much time that you're given on this planet. So you want to try to leverage as much of it as you can. So what do you do? You invest it in a, in a vehicle that makes sense, like real estate. In the case of this doctor you mentioned earlier, yes. I mean, he what he would do, because he didn't know any better, I'm sure. I didn't know the guy personally. This is just from observation. He would trade stocks between patient calls. I, I mean, this guy was doing like almost back-to-back -back patient 
like as a general practitioner, seeing seeing like a doc, uh, seeing a patient and then book another patient right afterwards. And if he had like three minutes between them because he fit he finished up early, he was immediately went ran to his office, did a stock <laughs> trade, and then go back out to see the next patient. I'm like, oh my god, dude! Like that to me is ex- that's to me is high pressure because can you, dude? Can you imagine, Chris? You're sitting there, you just traded a stock, and now you're the, the entire time sort of focusing on your patient. You're thinking about a freaking stock that you just traded. Like, oh my God, what is that? Like, who wants to do that? Right. Yeah. It's it's nutty. I mean, I'm no doctor, but I wouldn't feel good about seeing that doctor or that <laughs> pa- like if I were a patient, right? Listen, there are better ways to earn money, right? There's better ways to protect your wealth. And real estate is the only vehicle left. I'm sure there might have been something else. But where we are, not only in terms of the economic cycle, but where we are in the currency, right? Are, are the U.S. dollars getting printed into oblivion? And I know it sounds crazy and wonky, but if you compare the buying power of the dollar, even pre-2020, the buying power of the dollar has decreased significantly mm-hmm. just because of the amount of dollars that have been printed. So now the buying power of that same dollar has become less. Yeah. So- you want to try to leverage those dollars, those little pieces of paper to buy hard assets that aren't going anywhere. Yeah. You know, that's really what it is. I mean, some of the some of the properties we own, Chris, I mean, we're here in the Midwest, a lot of older assets, right, compared to like say out out, out west, right? Some of these assets have been around for a hundred years. The Rockefeller building in downtown Cleveland's been around for a hundred years. We own that asset. So you have that asset. That asset has has survived numerous, countless currencies that have trans that have been around for the last hundred years. How many different currencies have there been? I don't even know. Uh, like, too many. How many different <laughs> Venezuelan currencies have there been? Right, uh, Nigerian currencies, all these other currencies. How many currencies have there been? Tons of currencies. Uh, how many companies have have gone up and failed, publicly traded? How many of those stocks have 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 that have that um, has that building possibly seen? Right, compared mm-hmm. to that building still standing there. It's still there. It's not, it's not, it hasn't gone anywhere, you know. So real estate makes total sense, man. And if you own the asset the entire time, you get the depreciation the entire time. Why yeah. wouldn't you do it? You know, it makes yeah, total yeah. sense to me. Yeah, that's why it's uh, it's it's a great store of wealth. You know, cash is trash. You know, you got to convert your currency into something tangible and long lasting. Um, the other question, you know, before we get into can you talk about the economic cycle is you talked about, so you, w- you went from single family, then you went to larger deals and then syndication development. So, you know, physicians, main thing is they're pressed for time. Uh, where can they enter into this um, investing um, mindset? Is it, you know, of course, they don't want to be landlords. They have better things to do with their time, yeah. you know, development, you know, they may have to. So I'm curious your thoughts. No, that's a great question. Many of the doctor friends that I have feel the same way. You know, they they don't have the time or inclination to manage a property themselves. And I totally get it, right? So the best way is to align yourself with folks like us. We have, we have a great team of people that we manage the assets, right? And, and we have a track record to prove it. So a lot of it has to do with having the experience, right? We have, we've done, like I said, God, I don't even know how many deals we've done, how many deals we've syndicated at this point. A lot of deals we've syndicated, a lot of funds, or we started up funds as well that may steady, regular, passive income uh, on the net lease side anyway. I think what it is, is just getting to know the folks, folks like me that are active on social media and uh, do a little bit of research, give them a call, ask them questions, you know, see if you like them or not. You're not going to like all of them. Hell, a doctor might call me up and not like me. It's okay. You know, <laughs> it's fine. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, what am I going to do? Right. Um, the thing is, though, is that uh, one thing I, I always am, I'm very honest. Uh, we operate with integrity and that's how we roll. That's how the team rolls. That's how we do it. You know, so it, but really what it comes down to is is having the the having a strategy and in our strategy what we've done is we've have the the multifamily it gives quarterly returns multifamily is extremely choppy right and what i mean by choppy the c and b class stuff that we buy we we always say that it's going to be an annual return annual okay but even though you get paid on a quarterly basis it isn't like it's going to be consistent 
things happen, especially on older properties like a C or a B class asset. Maybe maybe there's roof damage and now you have to go spend NOI, you have to spend the net operating income. So that money now has to be spent on fixing something that didn't we weren't expecting, right? We always plan to hit the annual return target, but it's somewhat choppy, like I said, right? The development side of the business, like I said, big juice comes out of it, but you have to wait a little bit to do it. Usually 24 months before we do the refi, pull the money out, return it back to the investors and you cash flow it, right? The third line of business is then that lease business. And that you get a steady, extremely predictable monthly return, okay? Hmm. On the net lease business, you're not going to become a multimillionaire doing net lease. But mm. one thing that you will get is steady monthly return. Mm. You can count on. Why? Because every single one of those locations, like we went by like 10 or 15 of these stores that I mentioned previously, Dollar General, Dollar Tree, Walgreens, and one fund. And every single one of those funds is backed by corporate guarantee. Mm. And they're and because they're, I mean, they're traded on the stock market. Usually they're traded on the stock market. But one thing that's very important to these companies is protecting their credit. So they have to make the payment on time. They always make the payment on time. Mm -hmm. So if, if I know that the payment is going to come in on the first and I can write a check to the, to the investors on the fifth, it's going to happen. Right. And I mean, even if, if dollar general went out of business, they go out of business tomorrow, we as landlords get paid first before the shareholders do. Mm. Cause we have, we have legal leases, binding leases in force right now. Mm. It's a great deal. Right. So in our, in our example here, we have three different lines of business, have three different risk levels, three different risk tolerances, three different assets that produce good steady income for an investor, and they still get all of the depreciation and the appreciation that comes along with it. Mm -hmm. You know, Very different asset classes, but still produce income. So we try to produce, we try to, to create one solid place to go for any investor to take part in all or, or one or two or whatever of these types of uh, opportunities. So- that's yeah. how we do it, right? But you know, right now there's there's so many people out there. I mean, there's also folks that have never done this before. Mm -hmm. They're out there too. You know, just got to be careful if you're going to invest with those guys. You know, make sure yeah. they have a good solid team. You know, but like I said, we've been doing this for for quite a while now, and the, we're, we try to operate it as if we are a public traded company because it's my background. That's how that's how we try to operate our business, right? Yes. So, um, because at some point in the future, maybe we'll, maybe we do want to take a public, maybe. You know, yeah. so it's, we try to run it that way. Yeah. Fascinating. Then the other question is, uh, I know for a lot of doctors, you know, looking into, um, you know, doing their due diligence for people, syndicate syndicators, do they have to undergo like a SEC registration or register with, or can they just say, I'm starting up a syndication and start raising funds? Um, what's that, what's that process? How do oh, you no, man. Hey, that's, no, that's <laughs> a great question. You know, to just go and raise money, and just start making phone calls without having all the right documentation in place is asking for trouble. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's like, yeah, that's, that's a good way to get thrown in, thrown in yeah, jail, jail or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. So, so if, if, um, if, if anybody wants to look up a Ponzi scheme, what a Ponzi scheme is, yeah. Go ahead and Google it and you'll understand there's actually, there was a guy named Ponzi and he created, that's where the name comes from is Ponzi scheme. I don't want to get, in, get into all that, but, but it describes that. And there's another, the, the, I'm sure you know the case about the oranges, I think it was, right? It yeah. was the orange field in Florida, which yeah. caused this whole thing with the SEC regulations. Yeah. The, the point is, is that in our case, just because someone calls me up, they hear this podcast, they call me up and they want to invest in one of our deals. We don't just take them on right away. We never do. Like we want to get to know the investor. Uh, we want to get to know who they are, what they're about, what their goals are, because not every single investor is a good fit for what we're trying to do either. Right. Yeah. So, but everything that we do, 100%, what you said, everything is SEC registered. We're all, everything is on, on the up and up. Everything can be found um, we, we on the on the SEC website uh, as as well. So everything we we manage um, has been registered with the SEC, and we have professional professional teams in place that manage the different aspects of the business like we have one we have a set of attorneys that handle the the, the fund side we have a set of attorneys that handle our our development we have a, a set of attorneys that handle the acquisition three different mm -hmm. sets not because i like to make things complicated but it's because the people that that are groups that we select for each one of these separate lines of business are pros of what they do 
That's mm. why we got the best teams we possibly can get our hands on to manage the, the integral parts of these businesses, right? That's how we do it. You know, I didn't want to get like one law firm to manage everything because mm. I know that I have a, a very good friend that I'm very close to. He's a great dude, but he does my, my acquisition stuff. He's the best in town, best in class. I want to keep doing more of that. He doesn't really do net lease. It's okay. Different set of people do that and they're mm. excellent at it, you know? So that's generally how we do it. But yes, uh, everything is on the up and up. Everything's SEC registered. And if they're not SEC registered, they don't have a PPM. They can't spell PPM. You got yourself a problem and I would avoid doing business with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially in this day and age, you know, especially so many bad actors and scams and can't, you know, um, yeah, you know, other- or Chris, like, Chris, yeah. check this out. Check this out. Some, one of, one of my students- he was interested in uh, in investing in a deal, right? So he wanted me to take a look at some PPM that he got. And he sent over the PPM. I started reading through it. Well, first of all, the PPM was expired. It, it had expired a, a year prior. So there's, there's expirations as far as raising the money is concerned, right? Mm -hmm. And you kept, you read a little further and the guy had some woman as the construction manager, it wasn't even, it wasn't a real estate deal per se. It was some mm -hmm. other type of mm -hmm. setup, some other type of business that they were raising money for. Right. I don't want to get into what it is, but the, 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 some, some woman was a construction manager and read through her bio and her bio didn't make much sense. Like it was, she had no background in construction management whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I ended up doing the research and it turns out it's the guy's girlfriend. Mm -hmm. So like he basically installed his girlfriend to be a, development manager just mm -hmm. because right she wasn't qualified to be doing such things so mm -hmm. these are the types of things like i said earlier making sure you have the right team that's doing it it's nothing wrong with listen if, if your wife is excellent at what you're doing your husband's excellent at what they do and they're they're amazing at it and they're qualified that's one thing if they're not qualified to be a, a leader in that significant part of the business they should not be installed just because they're a spouse of some sort. That's ridiculous to me. Yeah, I don't yeah. get it. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. nepotism. So, right, uh, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, very fascinating. Com I've actually learned a lot. How can people, you know, contact you? I know you, you know, your team, and then you also have an education team. So, how can people contact you, follow you, check out your social media, et cetera? Yeah, Instagram, baby. Go to Instagram, <laughs> Augustino Pintus. So just Google me. Uh, I come up there. Uh, Bulletproof Cash Flow as well. If you do uh, bulletproofcashflow.com or Bulletproof Cash Flow on Instagram, LinkedIn, of course. And you mentioned the Green Room at LinkedIn as well, where yeah. uh, we're active on there. Uh, I, I do have posts uh, taking place on TikTok. You will not see me dancing on TikTok, however. <laughs> I don't want to disappoint your audience, but I'm sorry. I'm not that guy. Uh, I, what I what I work hard to do is make money for all y'all. That's what I do, right? Yeah. So, uh, but uh, but yes, I mean, we're, we're very active on social. We're really trying to get the word out. And, and yes, we also have, we do have an education part as well. So we, we help people that do want to get into this line of business either if they want to get into learning how to take down their first multifamily deal. Mm -hmm. And then we also have an advanced program, the accelerator, where we talk about syndicating deals. That's a, a much different type of program. But in that case, you're, where it's more on raising money, dealing with brokers, getting in front of the, the big money so you can actually get larger deals done. Right. So yeah. we have these two levels of program. Yeah. And uh, for all the audience out there is really fantastic conversation let's thank augustino for coming on all of his resources will be in the links and show notes and with that thanks so much for coming on to the podcast you bet you bet thanks for inviting me i hope you really enjoyed that wonderful inspirational motivational piece again if you wherever you are listening if you liked it be sure to like comment share subscribe we're on everywhere spotify itunes google amazon audible and without much ado be sure to thank this show's sponsors and we'll see you next week